and I'm a senior policy analyst at the Center for Data Innovation, which, for those who don't know, is a think tank focused on the intersection of data, technology, and public policy. Today, I'm delighted to be hosting this conversation on the EU's AI Act and general purpose AI systems. The reason we want to have this conversation today is because the most recent proposals for the EU's draft law on AI are seeking to expand the scope of regulation to include this new class of systems, general purpose AI systems. Today, we plan to explore three key questions. First, what are general purpose AI systems and why does the EU want to regulate them? Second, how exactly does the draft law propose to regulate these systems and what impact will that have? And third, what recommendations, if any, should EU policymakers consider to improve the regulation as it relates to general purpose systems? Thankfully, I have a really wonderful set of panelists joining me today. Um, we have uh, Kai Zena, who is the head of office and digital policy advisor to MEP Axel Voss in the European Parliament. We have Andrea Belias, who is the uh, international public policy manager at DeepMind. We have Anthony Aguirre, who is the vice president for policy and strategy at the Future of Life Institute. Andrea Miotti, who is the Head of AI Policy and Governance at Conjecture, and Irene Suleiman, who is Policy Director at Hugging Face. Thank you all so much for joining me. Um, and just a reminder for everyone that's joining at home, this program really is meant to be interactive and your questions and comments are most welcome. Um, so if you're watching online, you're invited to submit questions via Slido. Um, if you're on the center's website, you can see the link at the bottom of the page to Slido where you can submit questions. And if you're on YouTube or Facebook, uh, you should see the link underneath the video description. Um, but with that out of the way, uh, let's dive in. Anthony, I'd like to um, kind of set the stage um, talking about what GPIs are and, and why the EU wants to regulate them. Um, and there are a lot of terms being thrown around for these systems. Um, some people are calling them foundational models, others people call them base models, um, some people call them large language models. How would you explain what um, a general purpose AI system is for the purposes of our discussion? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's great to be here. Thanks for assembling this panel. Um, I think it's first important to be clear that general purpose AI system as a term is not really a term of art in the field of AI. It's kind of been used here and there throughout history uh, in quite varied ways, but, but we can talk about why we're looking at such a term and what it might make sense to include in it. Um, so as motivation, I would say, you know, for much of the history of AI and machine learning systems, you know, when we're lucky and when successful, gotten pretty decently good at some task that they're specifically designed or trained to do. Like, image or voice recognition or chess playing or search or whatever. Um, but something interesting has happened in the recent years, which is that AI systems have started doing successfully things that were not designed or trained to do at all. Like uh, if you take OpenAI's GPT models and other large language models, so-called, um, really all they're trained to do is predict the next word or symbol in a sequence. That's it. Um, they're just trained to, to accurately predict a word given a sequence of text before it. but they can be adapted to perform or, or perform with like a little bit of extra training, all kinds of different tasks like translation, composing essays, writing code, taking exams, summarizing text, even surprisingly doing arithmetic or playing chess, albeit very badly. Um, and there are other systems, not just la large language models like DeepMind's Mu Zero, uh, which is based on the same sort of learning engine that powered the amazing AlphaGo to, to victory over Lee Sedol can master pretty much any game you let it play. You don't even have to tell it the rules. It just learns the rules as it goes uh, and learns how to play the game at sort of superhuman levels. Um, and we're also seeing new abilities kind of surprisingly emerge from combining visual and text processing or diverse training regimes like in DeepMind's uh, so self-described generalist agent, Gato, uh, that does many, many different tasks it's trained to do, but also lots of ones that it wasn't. Um, so I think, so when I ask myself, what are we to make of this? I, I think it's fair to say that this kind of points towards, though it's not really the same as the sort of artificial general intelligence that companies like DeepMind and OpenAI, among others, are working to build. That's also a hard term to define, but there have been some efforts made. Uh, so for example, in his uh, 2017 paper, Francois Ch Cholet uh, defined general intelligence in terms of the ability to efficiently acquire new skills. So that's one hallmark of kind of human intelligence, we're really good at it. In another seminal paper, uh, Spanish researcher Jose uh, Hernandez Arayo defined generality and intelligence as the breadth of tasks at which a system is competent. And then there's also this sort of colloquial notion of artificial general intelligence as it's like this human-like, broad, flexible kind of intelligence that can do all kinds of uh, learning and performance tasks on all kinds of domains. Now, we don't have that sort of artificial general intelligence today, and it's unclear when we will by, by whatever definition, 
Um, but I think the trend and effort toward more general systems is very unmistakable. I mean, this is just the direction we're going. Um, and I think we have to talk about the how both today's and tomorrow systems uh, behave and, and talk about them in a way that captures this key characteristic that they can learn and do many different things, including ones that they weren't originally and intentionally designed or trained to do, because that's been sort of the paradigm of AI up until now. So I think that's the new thing and why we're looking for this new definition. Thanks, Alex. Um, Anthony touched on, um, you know, DeepMind's Gato and, and AlphaGo, AlphaZero. Um, what elements of general purpose systems, be it things like how they're trained or their capability or their generalizability, make them different from, you know, what we might term narrow purpose systems? What makes, what makes them different? I mean, there's several elements that make them um, different, first of which is kind of their their, their scale, their size, uh, which is significant in terms of parameters, in terms of data sets, in terms of um, compute use, um, in terms of capabilities, they also tend to be able to undertake a wider set of tasks and activities. So Anthony mentioned Gato, which is um, a generalist agent that DeepMind introduced a few months ago, and it's able to perform over 600 tasks uh, from playing Atari games to moving a robot arm. Um, so that's kind of a, the scale of activity is also much broader. Anthony mentioned Mu Zero, which is an interesting example for us. Uh, internally, we're trying to see whether it fits under the Japanese definition because it's not really a pre-trained model. Uh, it's um, an RL algorithm. Um, and I guess one distinction between narrow systems and more generalist agents is also the difficulty in foreseeing um, you know, how they will be used downstream. So in the case of MuZero, one of the um, applications we hadn't really foreseen was uh, it being used for video compression. So that was quite interesting for us to see how it could be used in a kind of application we hadn't thought about at all. Um, one more distinction, I think, is if we look back at the European Commission's proposal uh, in April 2021, there was no distinction being made between uh, narrow AI systems and general purpose AI systems at all. I guess every AI system would fall under scope if their intended purpose was considered to be kind of high risk. Um, and I think one of the distinction as well that we need to take into account now is that general purpose systems don't have an intended specific purpose per se. And I think that's one of the key challenges we have now with the proposal from the uh, French presidency. Thanks, Andrea. I'd love your, your thoughts on this distinction. Yeah, and in addition to that, I, I completely agree that I think uh, the capabilities uh, side of things is probably the most relevant to identify general purpose AI systems. Uh, I, I also look at them with a few other lenses. So in terms of capabilities, uh, this idea that uh, these systems are different from narrow AI systems because they, they can generalize to a wide variety of tasks, some of which are not even intended from the start and some of which can emerge uh, later. More generally, these are models that can be uh, adapted to a variety of downstream tasks and such as we, we have seen how like simple language models that predict the next token can be very useful uh, for, for coding and can even do maths. Um, from an economic point of view, that maybe was, was touched less so far, uh, what distinguishes them is that they, are, they sit upstream in the supply chain. So uh, from one uh, general purpose AI system, you can have thousands or tens of thousands of downstream consumer-facing applications. Uh, where GPT-3 is arguably only starting now to be uh, exploited in a very, very large variety of, of products and applications uh, more than two years after its, uh, its inception. And from a technical point of view, uh, one thing that does uh, bring many of current general purpose AI systems together, but might not be the case in the future, is the, the commonality of the transformers architecture, which seems to be the the dominant uh, architecture that works very well and people try, always try to beat it with something else and it never works. Transformers seem to be the, the present and for a while the, the future of general purpose systems. There are then some, some uh, smaller characteristics that however are might change in the future or are accidental uh, at the moment and perhaps regulation should only focus on the broader ones. Some of these, these, these smaller issues are uh, interpretability, so the fact that they're generally harder to interpret, uh, they are bigger and complicated, and but I would especially focus on the capabilities angle, uh, on the fact that they are able to to be adapted to a variety of downstream tasks. And yeah, 
Thanks. Um, Kai, maybe you could uh, provide some context about, you know, what the animating concerns were that led to the inclusion of um, general purpose systems um, into the current proposals. Uh, yes, sure. Um, so maybe um, to answer this question, I will um, just quickly also explain a little bit the timeline because it's rather interesting what happened here in Brussels. So um, as Alexander was um, explaining already in the original um, proposal by the Commission, um, general purpose was not uh, specifically mentioned. And um, also, I would say in the whole um, year of uh, 2021, when, when this proposal was um, published, um, it was rather a side topic. And um, the Slovenian presidency in their proposal in November um, 2021, they basically just clarified um, the commission's um, approach and said it's um, excluded, so not in the scope and therefore out. And then, yeah, I need to say Future of Life Institute. So Anthony's colleagues uh, here in Brussels did a really good job because um, it was them and a few other stakeholders that were underlining that there are potential risks and that we should maybe include it in the AI Act or at least uh, uh, have a broader discussion about uh, potential misuse or certain developments. And um, then first the French presidency and their new proposals in May tw um, 2022 um, were adding several articles and then also later on the European Parliament. So also the EPP group, the Conservatives and uh, the Liberals also proposed, uh, let's say, new articles that, that are covering general purpose AI systems. And now back to your questions. Um, I, I think maybe there are three main reasons why the European Parliament, as well as the Council, um, added uh, general purpose AI systems. And not all of those three reasons I support, and not all of them are making sense uh, in, in my mind. Uh, so first of all, definitely there is a fear of technology and potential developments that, yeah, Anthony was describing it uh, quite well. Um, there are a lot of possibilities. We do not really know um, how general purpose AI systems and also, yeah, uh, all those technologies falling under the umbrella term of AI are looking like in five years, in 10 years, and so on. And many people are really scared about it. They feel that there's a threat, and this was basically one of the reasons why um, they wanted to regulate it. Um, the second point is a competition um, argument. So there was this really well-written Economist article in June um, of this year, which was describing a little bit um, a situation where it's rather likely that um, the whole area of general purpose AI systems is again or will be again dominated by certain um, let's call it big tech companies, even though I don't like this uh, frame, but um, yeah, uh, several companies are always mentioned. And um, these new articles were seen as a little bit an approach against um, certain developments also in the competition area. And the third and last point is really responsibilities in the value chain. So um, we, we like certain aspects in the commission's proposal, other aspects not so much, but I think there is really, um, let's say, a common understanding that when it comes to responsibilities in the value chain, the Commission's proposal is really not so well drafted because, as we all know, technologies are rather complicated, similar to cars. They are um, involving a lot of different market players, and the Commission's proposal for that is very simplistic, let's say. So just focusing on one provider, one user, doesn't really cover um, a lot of um, use cases. And uh, there is now more and more research. Um, I think there's also soon um, a publication by the Brookings Institute on that, which is really nicely underlining um, that a lot of actual business cases are so for not falling under the AI Act. And again, with the additions, at least in the general purpose AI uh, system area, um, I think it was the aim to, yeah, to really involve the upstream provider or upstream companies a little bit more in the um, yeah, compliance with the AI Act. Thank you. I think that's a really useful context um, to kind of dive into the details of the 
of the proposed um, regulation. Um, and one of the things I, I want to talk about is how the, the text defines uh, GPIs. Um, and Irene, I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on, on um, you know, if you think EU policymakers can come up with a workable kind of quote unquote future proof definition when the AI community itself can't agree on one. All right, thanks for the easy questions. Hold on. Uh, my understanding of future proof is that implies some level of vagueness. And a lot of the criticism of regulation from myself and I feel the AI community, and I'm seeing also in the comments from Slido with GDPR, is the vagueness of regulatory definitions. It's partially necessary to have such breadth, and it is a tough job that I commend the authors of these acts on trying to cover so many types of systems. But it sounds to me it would be more helpful to taxonomize sets of systems and use cases uh, where they would be most likely to fit an existing risk based framework. So, for example, a language model. So, this is a predictive model that predicts the next uh, word given a set of words. Uh, I call a text generator oftentimes, GPT-3, for example. You could say, this is the system language models. Here are characteristics of a language model. Here's a use case, a mental health chatbot. And this would fall in the risk race framework as high risk. Uh, something that just spells it out a bit more would be easier to follow. That could be prescriptive and not future proof in that sense. But the way that the AI advancement is going, future proof is is a real tough one to hit yeah jumping on this idea of um you know not necessarily using a definition um one of the the way that the text defines gpies is uh, are those that have kind of generally applicable functions but some of the examples that it includes appear in narrow purpose systems too things like pattern detection um so alex you know what do you think of using a definition versus things like checklists or, or kind of you know what irene said yeah i mean I what Irene said makes sense. I think there's a general acknowledgement that the current definition proposed for GPIs is, is far from being very robust. Um, I think just to go back to what we were saying about the term GPIs, when we think about it, it's an acronym that no one was using or aware of four months ago. Um, and the fact that researchers and the AI community can't agree on what term to use is actually quite important because how can you define something without having properly scoped it um, or you know, kind of found, found the right term? Um, so there are inherently some limitations um, if we want to use the umbrella term of JetBuys. Um, there are some proposals to have a definition and have, in addition to it, a list of criteria, which seems to make sense. The criteria would, would assess the, the depth and breadth of a, of a JetBuys performance. There could be questions like um, number of tasks that it can undertake or whether it can uh, perform on a task it hasn't been trained before. I think that could help, uh, but I think you would still not solve the fact that JEPA is not a perfect uh, term. Um, Andrea, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm, I think no term is perfect, but I think in the AI community, there is a bit more uh, consensus. In the end, I, I see the AI community as being at least in partial agreement that the work foundation models is, is, uh, is, a good, is a good term that captures the essence of these models and uh, defined by Stanford High as models that can be adapted to a wide variety of, of downstream tasks. And uh, there is a difference, of course, between the AI community and uh, regulators and policymakers, as the AI community is uh, driven by engineers, uh, which can deal with more fuzzy concepts and don't need legal definitions to go ahead. Obviously, with regulation, we do need some stricter legal definitions, and that's where we need to shift uh, gears and, and go into the into more precise definitions because we can operate with fuzzy ones. Uh, however, there are many ways to address this. One of the, some of them are quite ambitious, but I, I think they're feasible. For example, one of the ITRE uh, texts uh, of the ITRE opinion on the AI Act was suggesting an idea of a EU benchmarking institute, or uh, there, there have been other ideas about a similar work at the EU level that to the one that is done by NIST at the US level to essentially have uh, benchmarks uh, to test models for their, their generality and their ability to, to show emerging capabilities. Uh, from the AI community itself, we have uh, Big Bench. Uh, we have all the work done in Big Bench, which is to well, benchmark existing uh, language models and see uh, what emerging capabilities they might have at larger scale or existing scale. So there are some ways to maybe be even more precise uh, and less fuzzy on generality 
that can be inscribed and they, they might come either directly from the act or from secondary legislation afterwards. But I, I, I'm quite hopeful that we can find a way to, to define generality for regulatory purposes as well. Irene, thoughts on benchmarks? Yes. Whew. So I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up, uh, Andrea, this, this question of benchmarks, and it speaks to conformity assessments in my eyes from the EU AI Act, but also from the AI community side. My dorky dream is for state-of-the-art performance to not just mean technical accuracy, but to include the qualitative aspects of a system like fairness and privacy protection. I'm seeing in Slido as well, these responsible AI ethical considerations, value alignment that often is not incentivized uh, from a product standpoint. So people help me realize this dream if anybody's watching and working on this. Uh, and a big question for benchmarks for general purpose systems is which tasks are you benchmarking? Uh, never underestimate a bored teenager with decent coding skills and an internet connection to find use cases that you might not have thought of. But also when you're evaluating these systems, there's no set of standards. Uh, there's no standards body or community group that has determined the best set of tests or benchmarks for a set of systems. So to cite myself as I love doing, Last year, I ran the process. I published a paper, which was spotlit at NURITS in December, a process for adapting language models to society. My co-author and I ran behavioral tests and what we called capability tests on GPT-3 and some fine-tuned and different models. For examples of capability tests, we ran basic math, summarization, trivia capability, SAT analogy, anagrams. Alice Swag, which picks the best ending to a story uh, or a set of instructions, which just gives you a sense of the incredible breadth of the kinds of tasks we're evaluating for. What, what is an appropriate set of benchmarks uh, in, the, in the capability, in the qualitative, in the behavioral side? And how can we get public sector guidance on this for something so general? Thanks. Uh, Kai? Uh, another kind of element of the definition is um, GPIs that might be used in a plurality of contexts, but it isn't entirely clear if a system that's used in two or three contexts is a GPI or it if it has to be somewhere in the hundreds. Um, do you think that there should be a line drawn? And if so, where? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so you you partially already uh, read out loud um, our our current text there, so it's um, a very similar approach at the moment in the council as well as in the parliament. So both definitions are basically concluding with the sentence um, GPIA um, system may be used in a plurality of contexts and may be integrated in a plurality of other AI systems. I still understand why it was put there, but I would agree uh, with you and I understand the, the concerns that you are raising. So it's very difficult to to um, yeah to agree there on a very clear threshold. So for example, um, can you speak about the plurality of context when um, it can be used uh, or if there are 25 potential use cases, for example? I, I don't know. So the number to come up with is very difficult and it's also for the um, general purpose AI provider, I think almost impossible to, <laughs> to find that out, uh, how his system potentially can be used in how many different use cases and so on. There are currently more and more debates on that. Again, in, in the council, they are a little bit uh, further in the process. In the parliament, we didn't really start it to discuss that. So there was no technical meeting on that point. There's basically at the moment just uh, the amendments on the table and everyone is thinking about it, uh, how to improve it. One option that we hear a lot also from stakeholders is really to delete exactly the sentence that I just read out loud out and um, to to make the definition much shorter but in the end it could even happen that we completely delete this uh, um, definition maybe even delete uh, the inclusion of general purpose AI systems again and solve it for example by an improved um, responsibilities in the value chain article so it's currently this uh, new article 23a which I think could really help if, if we make it um, clear that upstream and downstream 
um, there is a fair burden sharing. I think most of the general purpose AI use cases that uh, people were afraid of that they um, would not fall under the AI Act would indeed fall under and also the competition um, issue would be addressed. But again, um, it's really, really early at the moment in the process of the parliament. But yeah, I, I can um, tell you um, right now that I think most people in the parliament are very concerned that maybe certain ideas that were tabled do not really make sense and therefore we are aware that there is still a lot of work to need to be done on that part. Thanks Kai. Um, Anthony, another kind of area of consideration is this idea of um, accuracy, you know, whether there should be, con you know, the text should consider how accurately a system should perform on, on different tasks. Uh, for example, if you think about a system that's used for both playing a game and identifying cats, um, it might play the game with 99% accuracy, but only identify cats with 5% accuracy. Just because it can identify cats, does that make it a general purpose system? Um, you know, what's your thoughts on this this um, kind of idea around accuracy and, and spelling out capabilities? Yeah, I, before I answer that, I just wanted to make one comment on the, the general idea of like defining or delineating general purpose systems and do we or do we not have the EUA Act, you know, apply to them. I think it, it's fairly clear to me, and I'd be curious if, if the other panelists disagree, that, that the trend is sort of toward more generality. And if we, you know, as, as time goes on, if we were to exclude, you know, as, the, as there was an early proposal to do general purpose AI systems from the EU AI Act, there kind of would be nothing left. It would be, it would be regulating sort of the empty set of things. Uh, I think this is just a clear trend. So it's really a question of how we're going to understand the characteristics, what are the risks, where do they fall in the value chain, these different systems, and think of that in a future facing way that I think we need to be focused on. Um, so in terms of like how, how many different sorts of tasks uh, have to count or how accurate it has to be at those tasks. I think we, we do have to have definitions that make sense. I, after all, like, I mean, I can translate Swahili into Russian at, at some accuracy, but like that accuracy is really, really small. Um, so, so there has to be some sort of threshold. It has to be like comparable to something like a human translator or just a system that is, you know, out there that is doing translation um, as its task. So I think it, it has to be, you know, a single particular number like 5% wouldn't really make sense because 5% can be really good in some contexts and really terrible in other contexts. So I think it would have to be context dependent and most usefully, I think, comparing to other kind of extant systems that are doing that task in order to count as like doing a task in terms of diversity of tasks. Thanks. Um, did anybody have any comeback uh, on uh, Anthony's initial? Then I'm going to uh, ask Kai a follow-up, which is um, the approach to GPIs differs from the broader approach uh, of the AI Act, which is risk-based, um, but all GPIs have to adhere to high-risk requirements. What, what would you make of that? Yeah, so this is actually um, the argument for me against the um, current French proposal and also against several amendments that were um, tabled also from from us from our office from the epp group um on general purpose ai systems because well we we understand um the point that general purpose ai systems maybe have a slightly higher threat potential um that yeah that maybe we we should have some uh, specific rules but um Definitely what um, should not exist, what is currently in this text, is this direct link to the high risk obligations in Article 8 to 15. Because this, and I think it's rather clear now and um, based on the feedback that uh, we received and also based on all the discussions happened in the AI community after after those proposals were made, that yeah, it's, it's really impossible for a general purpose AI provider, no matter if it's now Google or a small startup and so on to um, fully comply with, for example, as a risk assessment in Article 9 or um, yeah, full human oversight in Article 14. It doesn't even make sense at this stage of the, um, of the process. So I think there, again, um, what I said already um, um, towards the last question, um, I think one potential um, 
way to to solve a lot of problems in one article is this article about responsibilities in the value chain so if you there really um, commit um, upstream provider to work closely with downstream provider um, and share information that is basically then necessary for the downstream provider to comply with the AI Act um, obligations, I think this could work. Again, for us, it's unclear at the moment if we really need to talk about general purpose AI systems, an easy way to avoid the difficult questions of defining what general purpose AI system is, is to just make it broad so that it would fall in. But again, on that part, yeah, it's it's a bit unclear how the final um, outcome um, of the policy process is looking like. But again, the point that um, making every general purpose AI system at this very early stage of, of uh, the whole life cycle fully um, yeah, fully um, applicable to all the high-risk um, AI requirements in Article 8 to 15. This is really something that will never work and would really backfire. So I think this became very much clear to everyone who was working on the AI Act in the last weeks and months. And again, I think taking into account what I said at the very beginning that we have had really here a long development uh, process in our discussion on general purpose AI system. Um, I think it was really necessary because now people spend a lot of time uh, discussing those issues and thinking about potential solutions. Um, and hopefully now based on, on, on this process that we uh, made and had and also the discussions that we had, we will find a better solution. <laughs> Yeah, Alex, what's what's your take on this uh, on this uh, on this point that all GPIs have to adhere to high risk requirements? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I agree with uh, with Kai. I think for me, what's interesting is that initially we had a very kind of clear conceptual framework with the European Commission. We had this pyramid of risk with the kind of prohibited uses, the limited and minimal um, AI system would become high risk, um, you know, depending on its intended purpose. Um, you know, the, the regulation was not about regulating technology, but the uses of technology. And I feel that now with this proposal, we've seen a really big U-turn um, that is kind of inconsistent with what the AI Act was going to be about. Um, I think for me, what's really interesting about this is that it's kind of a pilot of a, or a test of, um, you know, how the risk, um, the list of high risk system is going to be updated. So there's a mechanism in the drafts for every two years or five years updating the list of uh, high risk AI systems. Um, and if we take the example of JetPies, within a year, as Kai was explaining, we went from no mention to a blanket exclusion and now kind of high risk requirements at the development stage. Um, so I think we need to make sure that there's a process that's a bit more uh, formalized uh, with, you know, impact assessment and proper multi-stakeholder um, you know, involvement as a draft is being kind of refined. Um, so I hope we can kind of carry on some of the lessons to the next uh, update of the high-risk list. Thanks. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, open source. Um, Andrea, how important do you think kind of open source general purpose AI systems are for, for kind of technological development in general? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of great things from open source, but also some risks. And it's it's difficult to to balance to balance these, and that's what we're trying to do. For example, conjecture. Uh, a lot of the fund, funding members and employees they came from Eluter AI, a open source collective of uh, developing large language models, and they decided to start conjecture precisely because they realized that not everything should be open all the time, uh, especially with increasing emerging capabilities. It it can be irresponsible to just have everything out there all the time. And uh, considering that very often it's the developers that have the greatest control and the greatest ability to, to scrutinize their models before putting them out there, uh, there are some advantages with um, restricting or slowing down the, sp the spread of capabilities until we are sure that they're fine and they're they're okay with being with being out there. And in terms of for the regarding the exemption in the in, in some of like the, the latest uh, versions of the text, I am generally not too much in favor of, of exemptions. I see them as generating legal uncertainty. Like no no matter what the intent uh, behind the exemption is, uh, they just generate confusion and 
and generate loopholes that can be exploited in the in the text. So, for example, a, a developer, uh, if if uh, open source models remain completely exempt, a developer who was considering uh, having a model closed source could open source it to uh, bypass some of the requirements. That's not great, and that's uh, and generally these kind of loopholes tend to favor uh, large incumbents over small new entrants in a, in a market, as large incumbents can operate better in legal uncertainty and, uh, and unclear requirements, while they, they might uh, slow down uh, innovation from, from small incumbents. And we also are starting to see, uh, and we're, we're going to see it more and more, uh, some quite uh, concerning uh, capabilities emerging, such as uh, the ability to, uh, to generate arbitrary code uh, with language models. This obviously having more and more uh, code models, uh, open source, free, available to everybody, uh, is a quick way to accelerate the development of malware. That's uh, some of these capabilities might not be capabilities that we want to have available outside all the time. Uh, so it's it's a difficult balance to, to strike. But uh, I think in general, uh, fewer exemptions and more perhaps more streamlined requirements or uh, again, requirements based on some some, some testing and, and verification. Not not all open source models should necessarily fall under the restrictions that would be uh, too, too too much of a heavy cost for many open source communities, but some might. And fully exempting them is perhaps not not the not the best way to approach this. Uh, Irene, what are your thoughts on the inclusion or exclusion of open source models? Well, first, I want to give a big plus one to Kai and Alex's comments on your previous question. And I definitely agree with Andrea's take here, uh, really vibing with the, this panel's answers here. So I, I see model release as a gradient, where at one end we have closed, uh, not accessible outside an organization such as Imogen, uh, and the other side is fully open, downloadable, accessible, well-documented, like big science is Bloom. And why I'm so excited about openness, open source, is these really complex general purpose systems need many perspectives to be able to truly evaluate and understand the many aspects, such as the biases of it. As Andrea was saying, there, there are a lot of risks that come with opening increasingly powerful state-of-the-art systems, and there needs to be guardrails. This is also where I would love to get guidance from the public sector. I think a relatively low-hanging fruit is transparency in these bot disclosure laws, guidance on technical watermarking or mandatory labeling, so users are aware if uh, an output they're engaging with is human or AI generated. And having engaged with millions of AI-generated outputs, I myself can barely differentiate. Usually not. Uh, they, they've, they've gotten quite good between what is human and AI-generated. Uh, so, so for specifically hindering innovation on, on the open source side, I think that the public institutions need to be cognizant of concentrating power among high-resource labs as well. Uh, and how to guide openness to responsibly leverage the many perspectives that we need in, in capabilities research. Thanks. Um, Anthony, I, I'd love your take on kind of the kind of responsibility of compliance. Um, who do you think should be primarily responsible for complying with these requirements that we've been talking about and why? Um, should it be operators of the system or, you know, more so on the developer side? Or, you know, how should we balance the, the responsibilities? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, the ultimate goal of this piece of legislation is, you know, is for safety, to keep the public safe. And we have to think about what is the most effective way to do that. Um, and you know, where, how do we want to match up the the responsibility for making sure that AI systems are safe with the capability of making them safe? Um, in particular, you know, if you think about the the GPI systems like where we've been discussing, capability really requires two things. First, there has to be access to the model itself so that you can test it, interrogate it, play with it, filter it, you know, red team it, and so on. Um, and it also has it takes a lot of expertise and labor to make these large models safe. Uh, like huge teams of people often, from what I understand, to, to really bring them just into like basic civility, if you will, um, from, from their sort of untamed initial state. Um, and I think that's likely to become more and not less the case as models become more general and more capable and do more 
tasks. Um, so I think it, so, so I think we have to have that match um, between where the assessment happens um, and and where you're capable of doing it. So the the core, the initial developer, the one that sort of builds a first language large language model or or other GPI model, there are things that only they can do at some level unless they unless they do open source the code and and let everybody test that. But there are then only things that they can do in the sense that probably only they have the scale and the resources to do all of that testing. So I think it makes sense to have that uh, like have that basic stuff done by the organization that has the scale and capability to do it. At the same time, there are parts that they can't do. They're not going to know every use that that system is going to be put. They're not going to be uh, prepared to understand the, the particularities of the deployed system and like what its goals are and, and what it's trying to do and where its failure modes are. So there has to be also responsibility on the operator or deployer, you know, in operator is the EU AI Act lingo or, or deployer or that is actually providing the system. Um, so I think it really has to be sort of equitable. I think according to the principle that we really want safety, we want the, peop the, the organization that is best at representing and testing and ensuring the safety uh, be the one that is you know, responsible for the part of the safety that they can best take care of. We don't want a system where uh, one party is responsible for the safety, but they can't really do that. Um, and, I, and I think we have, you know, I, I've been very impressed actually with this this whole process. I just want to sort of praise the the EU legislative process here. It, I, I've seen legislative processes that uh, I would not want to praise, but but I feel like there has been a real uh, you know this is a difficult problem starting with an, an ambitious proposal. I think there's been an amazing set of sort of updates and seeing okay, we didn't quite capture this important failure mode or this important consideration. So let's let's update, let's update. There have been, you know, now several updates with the, the council position, with the, with the jury report that I've, I think, improved things at each step. Um, so I just hope that that will continue and we'll end up with something that, that really does a good, ha, is to good effect at keeping uh, these systems safe uh, for the public, even though they may not conform as we would quite like them to, to the, you know, initial draft of the law that was written. Thanks, Anthony. Um, Kai, I'd love to give you a chance to to speak on open source, on the open source inclusion or exclusion. Yes, perfect, because uh, Andrea was mentioning some important things I find. And um, yeah, Andrea, I would love to maybe also after this session to talk with you, with Irene and so on on this particular point, because yeah, also maybe coming back on what Anthony just said, there is really, um, I'm also we are now working longer at the parliament and exactly like Anthony was saying, there are a lot of fights where everyone is rushing to the finishing line and no matter how the regulatory outcome is here on the AI Act, it's really, let's say, a good cooperation between commission, between council, between also political groups um, in the parliament. Um, I talked already a lot about responsibilities and the value chain. Um, all three institutions are in constant um, contact there. Uh, really, yeah, it's really like at the university, we are trying to uh, work on, on improvements in the text. And uh, the same applies to open source. It was something that actually the Greens and the Liberals we are bringing in in the jury committee and um yeah we we had definitely the feeling that some of the proposals on open source that were uh, floating around here in brussels were really dangerous and um we are going really against the very concept of open source so some people wanted to make every individual the example was already um, being made uh, in any individual student that is uh, working on in the open source community on a certain system, make him or her fully liable or responsible if later on um, the code, for example, is being used in an AI system and this AI system is uh, violating some fundamental rights. And again, in our understanding, this would really destroy the whole concept uh, um, or the whole idea behind the um, open source community. And therefore, for us, the current solution that uh, we found and agreed up on in the jury committee is at least going in a really good direction because we are saying that um, 
no, no actor that is working in the open source community is liable, responsible for certain uh, flaws in the code, for example. But once um, the product, the AI system based on at least or with at least some parts um, on open source um, is being commercialized, so is being placed on the market, then of course the whole AI act and all the responsibilities, if it's for example, then a high risk AI system, System would apply. And personally, I think, again, it's at least a very good step forward because it clarifies uh, what the situation is when there is, for example, an AI system um, developed by a larger European company, but this company is using um, a lot of code that is coming from um, open source AI projects. But uh, also on that part, again, uh, we are still up for feedback and if you guys are convincing us that our solution now is still not perfect or certain elements are missing we are extremely happy to take this into account and make further changes uh, on that note alex what are your thoughts yeah no i just wanted to jump in the question because um how open source contributes to scientific innovation i'd really like to mention our alpha fold example um, even though I'm not sure it could be classified as a JEPI's alpha fold is our protein folding prediction system. Um, and when we developed it, we decided to open source it and we partnered with the uh, EMBL, so the European uh, Laboratory for Molecular Biology, uh, and kind of create a database where it was freely accessible. Um, and I guess for us, we have teams that are multidisciplinary at DeepMind, um, but still, we just, you know, there were so many downstream applications of alpha fold we couldn't possibly think about. Um, so giving away um, the data and the system itself and kind of open sourcing it was really a way for us to accelerate drug discovery and fundamental research. And it's been a year since it happened. And it's been really interesting seeing that half a million scientists from all over the world have been using it. Um, and just to go back to the risk point that Andrea mentioned, uh, before doing, doing so, we wanted to make sure we were on top of all the safety and ethics of it as well. So we spoke to over 30 um, experts, biologists or biosecurity experts to also understand what was the potential application. So I think what's really important in these discussions as well is for companies to also develop a risk management culture and cultivate it. And I feel that's kind of maybe a missing piece of the discussions in Brussels and somewhere where um, a lot can be learned from NIST that's developing this AI RMF um, which is really about empowering with guidance companies to understand how to kind of measure, map, manage, manage risk. I think you're on mute. Uh, Thanks. I, as the host, I had to be the one to, to break that barrier and do it at least once. Uh, I wanted to thank you. Uh, I wanted to use the last 15 minutes to, um, to turn to audience questions um, and a couple for, for you, Kai. Um, firstly, how is the EU looking at the UK's proposed approach to regulating AI? Um, and also, is there a sense um, you know, within the European Parliament that we should perhaps drop the, well, the AI Act, but you know, the GPI's element certainly um, altogether were some of the questions that we got? Yeah, really good question. So um, maybe to start with the UK model, it really depends um, to which uh, political group uh, you are speaking to. So, um, of course, we as EPP and also the Liberals, I would say we are feeling very close to at least certain aspects of uh, the UK approach, because also for us, um, well, we agree that there is maybe at least in some parts the, the need for a leg specialis on AI. Um, but those cases or really legal gaps in, in our view are still rather limited. So, for example, um, Axel and I, my boss and I, we worked on um, an AI liability own initiative report of the um, European Parliament. And also there we said, well, in most cases, fault based liability regimes in the national member states in Europe are already covering and addressing um, the, the current use cases of AI. But there are maybe a few exceptions, and especially if we want to be more future oriented and forward looking as a EU regulator, maybe it makes sense to already regulate now on those few very limited aspects. Um, and taking this into consideration or into account, um, the AI Act for 
us as EPP was maybe a little bit too ambitious. So we really see that, or it's our understanding that the second wave of AI, so mainly machine learning, deep learning, um, there is a lot of acceleration in the last years. And again, we don't really know where we are heading. We don't really know what AI um, systems of the second wave of AI systems would really materialize in, in five years, in 10 years. So again, our feeling is maybe it's a bit too early to come up with such a um, detailed, uh, let's call it hard law. And therefore, again, there is a lot of sympathy when it comes to soft law approaches, or at least, and this um, would be, I think, our preferred um, option. Again, having really limited um, fixes in existing legislation, for example, liability um, uh, legislation out there or anti-discrimination uh, directives and so on, where we could also add some articles um, on AI. And maybe on top of that, I think our group would also have um, supported very much some, let's say, high-level um, framework, um, maybe also taking ethical standards into consideration. So a little bit what the OECD and also other international organizations um, we are developing. But, and now I'm coming to the second part of the question, um, I think it's it's similar to the United States and um, yeah, Europe and other places in the world, at least, um, yeah, democracies, that once you are starting with a regulatory process, it's almost impossible to stop it. So <laughs> uh, we, again, would have maybe um, wished another approach by the commission, but now that they um, made this proposal, now that in the parliament, in the council, we have ongoing discussions based on this commission proposal, the chance to make a radical turn and really um, put it at sight and say, okay, look, we wait for three more years and give it another try. I would say the chance is almost zero. So one of the prime examples that I always like to make there is e-privacy regulations. So e-privacy regulations, the impact assessment um, came out, I think, in late um, 2016 or early 2017. Um, they wanted to to finalize it together with the GDPR, so really focusing with the privacy on communication data and privacy only. But um, council and parliament couldn't agree on one version, and now we are still in the trilogue, still in the negotiations, and um, yeah, informally everyone agrees that this whole proposal doesn't make any sense anymore because now we have AI Act, we have Data Act, we have a lot of other DSA, DMA and a lot of new um, legislation. But yeah, again, to pull the plug would require really strong leadership and also going against some some staffers in the commission that spent a lot of time in the proposal and so on. And therefore, uh, I, I do not know any example from the European Union. I would be surprised if um, something like this would happen in the United States uh, because of the aspects that I said. Thanks, Kai. Um, another one of the questions that we got, Andrea, was, um, is there no fear that only the biggest AI companies will be able to tick all of the boxes and that EU SMEs will fall in the cracks? Um, but actually, one of the articles uh, seeks to exempt small small organizations. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and, and your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. So, well, following up from my previous point, I already said I'm not a fan of exemptions. Uh, they, they generate loopholes. Uh, I understand why they're there, and, and I understand the, the idea of helping smaller businesses that indeed uh, face tough competition in this industry. Um, I also, uh, I think this industry is a, naturally uh, high capital intensive industry that requires uh, large capex investments to to get returns on them and as has been discussed uh, many times in the past including in the clark and ganguly paper uh, on, on language models uh, there is natural trend towards concentration in the ai industry so i i don't expect too many smes to be leading in developing GPAIs in the future as essentially they're like snowball effects of uh, accumulating data, accumulating compute, uh, developing models, uh, raising more money with those models, so on and so forth. I expect SMEs to be more placed in a 
downstream or midstream position in the supply chain uh, as, as deployers. And in any case, uh, again, exemptions lead very often to loopholes. It's perhaps best to help small businesses by having uh, more streamlined requirements for them and just more generally uh, making sure that only truly general systems are, are hit by the requirements for general purpose AI systems. And if a, a small business is developing or has developed and is deploying a, a general system, then yes, uh, they should, I believe they should comply with the same requirements as in the end, what we care about is not the size of the business, but the capabilities of the model. Kai, I, I know you have thoughts on that, so. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so no, I completely agree with what um, Andrea was just saying. And um, the council was um, putting in their proposal also this new article um, 55A paragraph three, which is the um, so-called um, SME exemption when it comes to general purpose AI system. And I think logically and also legally, it doesn't really make sense. If we agree that we should uh, put general purpose AI systems in the scope, um, for instance, because they are posing such a big threat and therefore should be um, harder regulated, then why do we exclude SMEs? Because as um, Andrea was saying, also SMEs could in this narrative uh, produce or develop very dangerous um, general purpose AI systems. And uh, yeah, I think it's really the wrong approach because also if you are concerned from an competitive angle, like I think the French um, presidency was, um, it would be easy for companies like uh, Google or Facebook to just um, create some, some small SMEs, which are very closely connected to this big tech company that, um, that uh, the French presidency uh, wanted really to concentrate on. So again, it's a really bad way of um, achieving what they wanted to achieve. And I think in order to cover the point, which was completely correct from your side, that um, probably these bigger companies uh, will have a really big legal team, a lot of um, experts that will help them to quickly be uh, fully um, applying the, the AI system. Um, SMEs and startups should not be exempted, but uh, should be um, receiving a lot of uh, guidance, a lot of support by, by governances. There should be fact sheets, um, some, yeah, some general guidelines. Also, I think digital innovation hubs here in Europe could help a lot. And of course, also regulatory sandboxes, which are helping them to, yeah, to, um, to make their technologies um, appliant with existing law and maybe also adjusting the existing law to new technologies. So I think those ways are, make much more sense um, to really help them and an exemption similar to what Andrea was saying would not make really sense and would really backfire in the end. Thank you. We've, we've only got like two minutes left. So I, I want to give everyone just um, you know 10 seconds, a final kind of comment on, on you know, moving forward, what your kind of recommendations or thoughts would be, because clearly, as Kai says, um, the EU is listening. Um, Anthony, maybe we could start with you. Okay, I, I think primarily, I think it's just, it is really important that there be a distinct regime for general purpose systems. It, it, this started as a use-based framework. If something has many uses, I think it just is unworkable to have it really take care of such systems correctly. So I think we just have to have GPIs treated separately, and I hope we can figure out a, a good and useful and workable way to do that. Alex? Um, yeah, I think the discussions have shown we need to improve our understanding of GPIs um, and what responsible development um, of GPIs would be, so for developers, but also for the rest of the value chain. So for me, well, I think except if the AI Act is really redrafted and we move away from the intended purpose, um, the responsibilities need to be on deployers, but I do think that developers still have a lot of um, work to do. There's so much happening in terms of ex-ante impact assessment, documentation could be improved. Um, 
more research into uh, safety and ethics as fundamentals. So I think uh, it's really important to improve our best practices um, and the processes uh, through which society and industry and policymakers can continue to kind of better understand JEPIs. And just in terms of the AIAC, there's so many different parts of it where we can include JEPIs in the sandboxing mechanisms, um, have an observatory within the uh, European AI board, for instance. Um, so I hope we can find a way to, even if there's a mention of JEPIs, under the French proposal, still a lot needs to happen to kind of um, kind of build a culture of trust and um, trustworthy AI beside the regulation. Uh, Irene? It is critical to work with many disciplines from technical experts, ethical practitioners, social scientists, and especially with underrepresented groups to provide specific technically implementable guidance on general purpose systems to hinder, uh, to not hinder, but to guide innovation in the right direction. Andrea? Uh, requirements should be shared between developers and deployers. Developers are the ones, with the technical capacity to actually understand what's going on in their models. The deployers very often only have access to an API. It's very difficult to just access an API to do a lot of things like reinforcement learning with human feedback, fine tuning and, and other things. So there should be an equitable distribution of the regulatory burden between developers and deployers and Hopefully, we can find a good balance here. Thanks. And last but not least, Kai, any final questions? Yes, thank you. So um, maybe two points. So first of all, I think we are on a good track right now. But uh, yeah, as I said several times, we are very much open for feedback. I think I can speak for all involved actors. And we are still trying to, to find an improved uh, solution on that. And maybe as a second point, um, because we didn't talk a lot about the AI board and the whole enforcement body. And I completely agree with Irina's point that um, we should involve a lot of different actors and have um, a lot of different perspectives. And I think also there, there is a positive development starting with the DMA, which has a high level um, expert group. And we try to um, reconstruct the AI board also in this direction, that there are really um, representatives from civil society, from international or at least European standardization organizations and so on. And I think um, if such an AI board in the end exists, um, it could also address a lot of um, points that are critical when it comes to general purpose AI systems and maybe also help to really bring in the perspective of um, yeah, the AI community and practitioners who are really facing um, general purpose AI systems on a daily uh, level and normally um, are not listened to uh, from a policy field, let's say. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all of you for your for your insights. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining and your questions. Um, this has been a really useful conversation. Um, and I, I'm really grateful. So thank you so much. Thank you.